today's episode, Dr. Tom Callen joins us once again to share his insights on detoxification, viral theory, and the importance of clean, liquid, crystalline water. Dr. Cowan encourages us to question everything until we arrive at an answer that makes sense. Listen in with a curious mind and prepare to be blown away. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. And in today's episode, we have for our cleanse and detoxification series that we're continuing on with Dr. Tom Cowan. And we had Dr. Tom on back with us when we did the Science, Mysticism, and Beyond series. That's when I first connected with him. He had some really amazing things to say. It was a really well-received episode. And I really love Dr. Tom Cowan's approach. I mean, he literally says, question everything. That's one of the models he has on his website. And the idea is that he doesn't necessarily know the answers to everything, but he's pretty clear when something doesn't really make sense or doesn't arrive at an answer that seems to make sense for him and that probably needs to be explored in much more detail. Part of the problem I think that we have seen, because he's had a lot of press around his concept around viruses, and he wrote a book called The Contagion Myth, and he's questioned that. And a lot of times if people don't dive into that, they just think, oh my gosh, questioning viruses, whatever. And I am now, and I didn't understand either until I actually started to explore what he was even talking about. And what he's going to talk about in here is he's just going to outline what the procedure is to isolate a virus. And this is really important because we've based so many treatments and so much, I mean, that is a foundation of a big aspect of medicine. And what he's kind of showing is that the entire process itself could be flawed. And that if it's flawed, why are we basing so much stuff on a flawed procedure? I mean, I used to think that when we isolated viruses, that it was very much the same as how we would isolate a bacteria or something. I mean, the process, you would take a certain sample and you'd break it down and you'd separate it out. And then you would see a very clear picture of what the bacteria or the bacteriophage was. And what I learned is that the process for isolating a virus is very different, and there's a lot of potential problems that might be inherent within the actual procedure of isolating. So he's going to go through that with you guys so that you have an idea of what he's even talking about and why we need to find better systems to isolate stuff, better systems to then try and figure out what's actually going on, what is at the root of why people get sick. And again, he's not saying he knows exactly what the answer is, but he's saying there's problems with some of the ways that we use procedures to figure things out, and this being one of them. So I think this was really fascinating to find out about. Now, this series is more around cleansing and detoxification. So then we kind of dive into that world a little bit around what do we actually do then? What causes ill health? And then what are the things that we can do to clean our body to detoxify from it? One of the concepts that he gets into is the importance of water. And I'm not just talking drinking six to eight glasses of water a day. I mean, he's getting into the structure of water, the mechanism on how water can literally receive impulses from everything in our world. I mean, everything from chemicals and hormones to EMF, to toxins, to the way we think and to the way we feel. Water is this medium of exchange of information in a lot of different ways. And he kind of explains more around that, which I think is absolutely fascinating. We also, towards the end, get into the concept around what does it mean to be connected back to nature? As a lot of times we talk about that. What are some of the big things? What are the, some of the things that we can do to try to mitigate maybe around EMEMF and some of this stuff that could be very much at the heart of why we are setting our environment up, distorting water, and causing ill health and disease? And what do we need to actually detoxify from? So hope you guys enjoy this episode. Make sure that you like, share, subscribe to our channel, share this information as much as you can. If you find this information beneficial, please share it. That is the best way that gets this information out. A lot of times information on natural health is very much censored in the logarithms that help to get this information out are not very supportive for it. So the best way that we can get this information out to the people that want to hear it and that will benefit from it is through all of you guys helping to get the information out and sharing it. So thank you very much for your support. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast. And as we continue on with our series on cleanse and detox, and today we're bringing back Dr. Tom Cowan. And if you haven't seen our old episode, I'll put a link here so that you can click on it and check it out. We had uh, Dr. Tom with us back 
in our series we've done science mysticism and beyond probably about a year and a bit ago so i'll put a link for that we had a really great conversation and i wanted to get his insights on around detoxification and cleansing because he's got some really interesting concepts that a lot of people don't talk about um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Dr. Tom, he is a well-known alternative medicine doctor, author, speaker. He's written a number of different books, including The Contagion Myth, co-authored with Sally Fallon Morrill, Cancer in the New Biology of Water, Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, and I believe your most recent book, Breaking the Spell. There's a ton of information on drtomcowan.com. He shares lectures, interviews, lots of information on his website. So go and check that out. And you can also see some of the amazing products that he does there, as well as at Dr. Tom's, or sorry, drcowansgarden.com. And I'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Tom, welcome back to our show. Thank you. Thank you for talking with me again. My pleasure. I, I always look forward to our conversations. You know, when I'm going through your website, one of the things that jumps out at me that I really appreciate is your motto that just says, question everything. And not in a paranoid way, but in a way that I think opens up the possibility to continually pursue truth. I think that's at the heart of it. And that's really at the heart of what science is really supposed to be about. You know, no, and, and I think what I like about that concept is that if we really are abiding by that, there's a certain level of detachment that is inherent in that process to be able to question things. You got to be willing to let go of what you think you know in order to expand into something more. You know, and I, I think this is this is a concept that I think is really important for everybody right now is, is questioning what we know. And it's really easy to get pretty cocky on what we know. You know, if, if I was talking to my wife earlier, I said it reminds me. I used to do karate for a long time. And when I was 18, I actually went to Japan and trained at the home dojo with the sensei. And he was like main, one of the main guys for our style of karate in, in Japan. And we were watching this Kung Fu movie and we're all sitting there together watching this movie. And he kind of looks at us, he pauses the screen and he looks at us and he goes, the information in karate, he goes, the information in Chito Ryu, which was our style of karate, he goes, would fill this thimble. And he pulls it a little thimble. He goes, the information in karate, he goes, would fill this glass. He says, the information in kung fu fills this whole room. And it was this idea of just when you get, when you focus so long on one specific thing, like a style of karate, for example, you start to think you know it really well. And you start to think that that's actually it. And then it's, it's a good reflection sometimes to realize that what you know may be such a small piece of a much more vast field of information. So I, I think that I just wanted to tie that in because I really appreciate the concept of question everything. And there's so many things that we have built as a foundation for how to do everything else. So one of the things that you've talked about really well, and I think very eloquently, is just around how we isolate viruses. And you talked about the work of the original work of John Ender, and I think yourself, along with a couple of other people with Dr. Kaufman, and, um, did a study again to sort of relook at this. And I'm wondering if you can share with people that concept, because I feel like right now it's really important that we do question everything. And what I also like about your stance is you're not trying to say this is exactly what it is. You're just saying it's not this based on this information. So then it opens the door to let's figure out then and explore more deeply. Okay. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Mark Twain who said, it's not what you don't know that gets you. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> and that's uh, the other thing is I, I mostly refer to science and medicine these days as the I don't know what's the art or practice the practice of saying using complex words and concepts to convince you of things that you would never believe otherwise. <laughs> so as far as this whole thing with isolation, you know I, I've tried out a number of ways of explaining it. But what I mean by that uh, complex and believe otherwise is if you went away for a week and you came home and your house was uh, smashed to the smithereens, it was in a pile of rubble on the ground, right? And, and you obviously would want to know what happened here. And somebody said, well, these very tiny little gremlins came and they ate your house down to nothing. Now, 
most people would be a little skeptical of that, or, or at least they would ask, well, you know, did you see the gremlins? And the guy says, no. He said, how big are the gremlins? Well, they're about the size of a mosquito. Well, but we can see mosquitoes. How come you can't see the gremlins here? Well, we just couldn't find them, but we have another way of figuring out that the gremlins did it. We looked and we saw feces that we think may have come from gremlins, although it turns out mosquito and fly feces is the same as gremlin feces. And most people at that point would think, I don't believe this. This is nonsense. And they could give you all kinds of other reasons. Well, we found little wings and th these may be from gremlins. Uh, or we found pieces of DNA or chemicals. And, but it's all avoiding the question of why, didn't, why can't you find the gremlins and then show me that gremlins can eat your house, right? Now let's apply that to virology. Uh, and I, I can tell you that it, in the entire published history of medicine and science, right? And we've looked. There is not one paper that describes finding a pathogenic, i.e. disease-causing virus in the tissues of or fluid of any person who's sick. Now, we have approximately, and I'll show you one in a minute, 185 or so institutions like the CDC and the NIH and the Robert Koch Institute and this ministry and that ministry, we asked them, can you show us a, a, a published paper where they took a person who died of COVID or, me, or a person with measles or a person with AIDS and in, the, in some fluid of them, some tissue, blood, urine, snot, show us the HIV or the measles virus or SARS-CoV-2. And they say there is no such paper. And then they say that can't be done. And you say, why can't it be done? Uh, they give you two reasons. Uh, one is the viruses are intracellular pathogens, so they don't come outside the cell, so you can't see them. And then you ask them, well, how does it get from one person to another? Well, it gets outside the cell and goes in a droplet and goes to the next person. You say, I thought you just told me it doesn't get out of the cell. Well, it sometimes does. So that's one reason. The other reason that I was given the other day is there's not enough to see. So think about that for a minute. I, if you, you actually could, uh, if you want to put this in, in, again, realistic terms, like what is the volume of viruses in a person who supposedly dies of COVID, right? So we're putting this in real world terms. Now, and the reason it's important is they say these viruses explode your cells. So the amount of, vi of viruses, if it was the size of this thimble you talked about, you could easily see that. So it's nowhere near that amount of viruses. What about the size of a pinhead? Easily see it. So it's a, a thousandths or less of a pinhead. That's how many viruses are in the person who died from AIDS or SARS or, or I mean COVID or measles or whatever. Now, if that's a mechanical problem that exploded a number of your cells the size of a thousands of a pinhead, like how does that do you any harm? Like you can take out a baseball sized piece of your lungs and you know, you have a pretty bad day, but it's not going to kill you. Uh, so the whole thing makes no sense. So then the question is, so if you can't find the virus, right, how do they know? Why do they say they, they know, have evidence that it's there? And why are there 10,000 papers called the isolation of SARS-CoV-2 or measles or HIV or whatever, right? 10,000 papers. So what are they doing? So here's what they're doing. And again, think back of the gremlin kind of thing. You can't find the gremlins. 
you can't find the virus, so they take an exa a, a sample of the snot from somebody, right? They say you have COVID. They take your snot. They don't take anything out of there. It's got microbes. It's got pieces of protein, DNA, dead cells, and maybe a virus. And then they mix, so they filter it, get rid of the big stuff. And now you've got proteins and all kinds of uh, DNA and uh, so-called viruses, you know, all kind of debris. And then you, add, you mix that with a cell culture, which is monkey kidney cells. And then you add fetal calf serum, which was extracted from in utero fetuses in cows from their heart, believe it or not. And then you mix that together and then you take away the nutrients of, of, that, of the cell culture, right? You starve it. And then you add amphotericin and genomycin, which are two kidney toxic antibiotics, right? You add that to the kidney culture from monkeys and then the monkey kidney cells break down. That's called a cytopathic effect. And then you say that proves the existence of the virus. That is called, that, that thing I just described, that process is called the isolation of the virus. That's ridiculous. They didn't find anything. They didn't start with a pure virus. They never found the virus. They just said, look, it breaks down. So what you're referring to is Enders, of the, who started this nonsense, said, okay, I'm going to take measles, snot. He filtered it, mixed it with uh, calf serum and em cow embryo fluid and put it on monkey kidney cells, added antibiotics, took away the nutrients. It broke down and he said that proves there was a virus. And then he did it without adding anything from somebody with measles, right? So he just added the calf serum and the bovine heart stuff and the antibiotics. And it, st it broke down and he said it was indistinguishable from the first one, which proves that it's not a virus. But somehow they overlooked that and that became the way to find a virus and nobody checked it since. But so that's the part you, that drives me crazy, Tom, is how does that even go that far? Like, would that not have made the experiment null and void basically right there? Like, how, how does that stuff even move forward from that point? If you use common sense, but if you say, well, viruses have to grow in cells, so it must have grown and then we can see these particles afterwards you don't know whether the particles came from the quote virus or from the breakdown of the kidney cells in fact now we know that the breakdown of the kidney cells and i can show you some pictures they look identical to what we call viruses so there's no way to tell why did it move forward because I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> they just, they, they, you know, they just did. So we repeated it. And if I can sh share yeah, my go screen. Ahead. Uh, let me just start. So here's a quote, California Department of Public Health. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they asked, we, we, they were asked if they have any record of SARS-CoV-2 from any patient on the planet or any analysis of the so-called Delta variant, and they said no. Now, here are the four major papers that were responsible for uh, proving that SARS-CoV-2 existed. They're all called isolation, emergence of an, uh, you know, identification of a coronavirus isolated, virus isolated, etc. When they were asked, did they actually purify and isolate in the common use of the word? You can see their answers was no. We didn't find anything. The principle here is you can never know that a piece of something came from something unless you have the something first, right? 
Mm-hmm. If I said this is a piece of a unicorn, a hoof, unless you've seen a unicorn, you wouldn't believe it, right? If I say I have a piece of a gremlin that ate your house, a wing, you'd want to see, let me show me the gremlin and I can see whether that wing actually came from the gremlin. And if I couldn't, in, in, and we're talking normal language, you wouldn't believe me. So here's what we did. We took, you know, vertical column uh, number one. I don't have a cursor here. Uh, so we just grew the cells. This was with Stefan Lenka, and he hired uh, a cell path, you know, grower person to do this. And we didn't add anything. We had a little bit of antibiotics and nothing happened on day five. That's column one. On column two, we took the culture and we added fetal calf serum and a little bit of antibiotics. And there was no cytopathic effect on day five. Nothing happened. Right? You with me? Yep. I'm following along with the cursor for the audience. Day three, we did the same cell culture, 1% fetal calf serum. We took away the nutrients exactly like all the isolation experiments for the last 20 some years. And we added the three antibiotics that they use in all the isolation experiments. Day five, the culture broke down, cytopathic effect proves the existence of a virus, even though there was nothing from anybody or anything that could contain a virus in the mix. Then the fourth column, we did it and we added RNA from yeast. So again, no virus, nothing from snot, nothing from anybody who's sick. It broke down in exactly the same way, proving the existence of a virus, except there was no virus. And because we added RNA, we could actually recreate the genome of (laughs) SARS-CoV-2, even though there was no SARS-CoV-2 in there. And you recreated it from yeast. (laughs) It's just pieces of small pieces of yeast because no genome has ever been sequenced and or found and sequenced. If you want to know what the sequence of letters in a book are, you start with the book and then you go this, T-H-I-S, B-O-O-K, etc. And then you do the whole thing and you have the sequence. They don't do that. They start with 23 million little pieces of RNA and then they overlap them and align them. They get a hundred, they get a million different possibilities and they choose the one that they think represents the actual genome, and that becomes the the reference genome for SARS-CoV-2. Now, then then they show you, sorry, you know, pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, in this culture, you can see pictures. Well, not like this, this is a, a, a fake picture. If you believe this is the virus, then you believe that's a unicorn (laughs) or that. It's even better. Uh, They show you this, right? See that thing? That's the virus. Now, it's obviously not purified because it's got a whole bunch of other goop in it. And so why isn't it the one on the left or the other one? Now, the problem is you can show this exact images like this one is from a kidney biopsy from the 70s. And it looks identical. And so all you can say is when cells break down, they have these little dots, which they erroneously say are the spike protein, but which turn out to be a common human protein called clathrin. And here is an an article published in peer reviewed journal saying, we observe morphologically indistinguishable inclusions in renal biopsies from before COVID they are indistinguishable from SARS-CoV-2. And you can read the whole paper, it's kind of boring, but, and they've known about these things since the 70s. They know that there is no way to tell uh, whether this is a virus from the outside or just break down. And uh, I, yeah, let me just stop there. I may get back to this, so let let me stop there for a minute. So it sounds like one of the big take-home messages on that, Tom, is that it's pretty much impossible to tell if, or I shouldn't even say impossible to tell because you've actually proven it, but that 
when people are doing this process to look for a virus, what they're seeing is the artifact of the process in trying to find the virus, not necessarily the actual virus. Right. There is no virus. They're looking at the process and they've never done proper controls to see if it's the process that's doing it or if there's an exogenous virus. And to our knowledge, and we believe me, we've looked, there is not one actual proof that any of these disease causing viruses exist. Every analysis is done on little pieces of it without any evidence or 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 facts of where these pieces came from. And the problem is the pieces of genetic material which they align or assemble into a genome turn out to be identical to the pieces of RNA that we have. <laughs> and so there's no way to know where they came from because the fact of the matter is there are no pathogenic viruses. There's just people, you know, our tissues break down into these little particles. It's just natural. It happens more when you're sick. And so naturally you get more little pieces, you know, if you breathe in coal dust or something. And that's all you're looking at. And we've built this incredible edifice based on pure, illogical, irrational, anti-scientific nonsense. Well, I feel like that's that's where a lot of the the struggle comes is that to actually look at it in the way that you're looking at it, to question it, really means then we have to then find a better approach. But in doing that means you kind of have to let go of all of this other stuff that is built on this foundation that they've created, which is, from the look of it, not valid. So it, it's letting go of everything. So then that's like cr crumbling this old paradigm in order to do something new, which is usually where you run into troubles because people don't often want to let go of the old paradigms. I mean, whatever, you know, it's up to them. Um, so then I guess the next question would be, and this can tie more into as we move along into detox and cleansing, but from your perspective, then what is at the root of disease and ill health? Where do you feel like that starts to come from? Uh, so let me, let me show you another thing, and I can, I can describe that, I think, in pretty reasonably precise terms. Um, so let me share my screen again, if I can, because I think it'll help. So here's another thing which we've led to believe is reality. So in order to answer the question, what is detoxing and, and how, why do we get sick? Uh, you have to understand what we're made of, right? Now here's, we're made of, we're told we're made of cells, which by the way, is an interesting and perhaps questionable fact in and of itself. But let's just say for a minute, so we have 188 different tissues, 44 of them, there's no cells like the lens of your eyes, but some of them appear to have cells. So you say, what is a cell made of? And then you get this diagram, right? We have mitochondria, we have Golgi vesicles, lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, centrioles, you know, all this microtubules, nucleus, etc. Right? Everybody knows that. Now, how did they find these things? Well, the, uh, they took some tissue, so, you know, some sample, and they dissected it. They took it out of its living system, dissected it, and then they put it in a bath like with alcohol or glutaraldehyde, and then they froze it to 180 degrees or so below zero. And then they mixed it with a bunch of enzymes and a bunch of heavy metal stains. And then they shot an electron beam at it, which dehydrated, got rid of all the water. And then they show you a picture on an electron microscope. Now, if I said to you, Jason, I want to know what your hand looks like and what it does. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut your hand off your body. Then I put in an enzyme bath, and then it's going to dissolve all the soft parts. And then I'm going to grind it up in a blender. Then I'm going to freeze it to 180 degrees. And then I'm going to soak it in a, a cadmium bath. 
and then I'm going to shoot an electron beam at it and get all rid of all the water. And then you got a pile of of mineral of dust on the table, and I'm going to take a picture of it and show you what your hand is made of. Mm -hmm. Again, my point is, if you think about this not with high concepts and things that you don't understand, you say that's ridiculous. You can't understand what what my hand looks like or what it does. But that's how they got this stuff. Now let's take one of these, a ribosome, right? So you see there, I have a cursor. They're always circles and they line the endoplasmic reticulum like this. And this is very important ribosomes because we're told that the proteins are made on the ribosomes, right? They're the factories. RNA is translated into proteins on the, in the ribosomes. So this mRNA shot, it goes to the ribosomes and that turns it into proteins. But every single picture of a ribosome is a circle. Every slide of a ribosome is a circle. Uh, whoop. I don't have pictures of it. I have pictures on another slide. You have to take my word for it. Now, uh, so everyone is a circle, perfect sphere. Now think about this. If it's a circle on a slide, it was a sphere in real life, right? Now, remember, we put this in a blender and macerated it. So what are the chances if I gave you an orange and told you to put it in a blender, that every piece of that orange would be a perfect sphere? No. Mm -hmm. Right. Zero. In other words, there is no ribosomes. This is an artifact. It's in fact, a guy named Harold Hillman, who's looked at this for 50 years, all these structures proved that this is a gas bubble that picks up stains. The gas comes from dead and dying tissue. There are no ribosomes. There is no microtubules. There is no endoplasmic reticulum. There is no Golgi apparatus. There is no lysosome. There is no Golgi vesicles. All of these things are artifacts seen by the way we can only see them on electron microscopy. And that means that the tissue was processed out of any bearing on reality. And he goes through in details who found them and how they can't possibly be, be actually true. And sometimes he says, well, here's how you can make that same picture without any cell at all. And so at the end of the day, and to answer your question, what actually do we see in a living tissue? And that's all there is. We have a membrane, we have a nucleus, we have these little things called mitochondria, and the rest of it is water. Now the water is organized like a gel. And it's organized because it has proteins in it and minerals which form the internal structure to organize it like jello so if you imagine jello you make jello by putting water and proteins you heat it that unfolds the protein and makes and makes a gel when you cool it and that's exactly the process except instead of heat we use a chemical called atp and that organizes the water into a crystal so the system that we're working with is we have this nucleus, which is uh, shaped like a circle, like you can see, right? And it has a chemical called DNA, which is not a double helix, but the water is a double helix, and it uses DNA to form this double helix chemical. So we have a, 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 essentially a rod stuck in the nucleus embedded in the cytoplasm, right, with a membrane. Now, here's how health works, as far as I can see. You, the, the cell, the tissue, you, take in energy from the outside through this antenna. We're talking about electromagnetic energy. We're talking about light energy. We're talking about sound energy, thoughts, feelings, you know, birds, love, emotions, everything. It gets amplified in the nucleus, downloaded into the cytoplasm, into the water, 
and that creates the structure called you. If you mess up the system, particularly by putting poisonous stuff in the water, then you can't download it and you make, you know, funky proteins, funky you. And that's what we call disease. Now, detoxing is simply getting the stuff out of your water. That's why the primary way is through fevers. Just ask yourself, if you have this gel, like Jello, and it's got a poison grape in it, and you stick an antenna and a dome on it to download information, but you got a bunch of poison grapes in your Jello, what would you do to get it out to clean the Jello? Well, I would melt the Jello, and then I would reconstitute a better Jello. That's what your body does. It makes fever that melts the gels. Then it makes mucus to flush it out. And then it reconstitutes a better gel. And if you look at the Gerson diet, fasting, fever therapy, detoxification, chelation, it's all the same. It's just, you know, getting the poison out of your gel. And so all you have to worry about is what are your inputs? Is the input that you're living in a house that everybody hates everybody else? So that creates a field that you then download and create a hateful protein. Now, for those who say, so we don't need any codes, we don't need any ribosomes, all we need is information and the intelligence of water. Now, for those who say water can't make you, let me show you this. So this was a picture by a friend of mine who, who took a Petri dish of water and she, she showed it a wedding invitation. And then she put it in the freezer and said, water, show me the wedding invitation. Took it out seven minutes later and there's a wedding ring because the water showed her by making, in this case, an image, crystalline image of what, of her question, her consciousness. Now, uh, if I asked you, I love to ask people this question. If I asked you the question, water or Jason, show me what is falling down. What would you show me? I'm not sure what. Oh, <laughs> right. That's the answer. That's what water did. Now, that that's because water knows <laughs> it's smarter than us. And that's the best answer. If your medium is pictures, mm -hmm. right? it can't sing. Here comes the bride because it doesn't have a voice. But in you, it can create your living substance. Now I can show you a whole lot of people who say, you know, uh, organisms are dynamic living crystals. Uh, or guy who made the noble Sven Gorky, the molecular structure of water is the essence of life. Uh, we found in our laboratory, this is a guy who knew more about crystals, that the living crystals is liquid crystals or mesophase. Uh, water is different than bulk water. And cancer is when your water loses its crystal structure and becomes just like liquid water. That's like edema. You get water that falls down because it's heavier, and that's not right. We see this in every religious tradition. Now, if you really want to uh, blow your mind, uh, let me show you this. So this system we're working with is antenna, right? That's the spiral <laughs> downloaded into a, a circular or spher spherical dome, then embedded in water to create, to cre take information and create living substance out of that. Right. You got me? Yeah. Yeah. So look at this picture. You know what that is? That the, the Taj Mahal? 
Taj Mahal, what do we see? We see an antenna, right? Yeah. Bunch of them downloaded into a dome, a bunch of capacitors <laughs> yeah. into the water. I mean, <laughs> what did, who built this and what did they know? Or how about this one? That's the Vatican antenna, always yeah. made of copper or something, dome, capacitors into the water. Here's another one. Turkmenistan out in the middle of the desert. They don't you can't see the, the spires, but antenna dome into the water. And I'll show you a final one. This was hundreds of years old before we could have before we had air travel. How do you make this if you can't see from above? <laughs> what is that? It's a it's in Turkmenistan, the middle of the desert. Wow. How did they make this? For what reason? But this is my point is this is the system. And if you want to talk about detoxing, you have this uh, polluted water or polluted energy. So if you don't want to be poisoned, don't suck on polluted energy or don't suck on polluting chemicals which dissolve in your gels which make it so you make bridges that are falling down because that's what we call disease i, I think that's fascinating you know i remember when gosh it was probably like 22 23 years ago when i first came across the work by uh, dr emoto when he did some of the work yeah. originally with the most people are kind of aware of that and I remember when I saw that and just my, my whole body was lighting up, just thinking there's something really profound about what he is coming across there. And then hopefully more research will be done on that and we'll, and we'll progress with it. And, um, you know, and even, even talking to like Lynn McTaggart, who had done some studies with, with Dr. Emoto and some other people that we've spoken with. I mean, it's pretty amazing stuff. So when I see that, inherently something feels very true around that to me and something really important, right? Even if we can't completely explain all of the details around it yet, it's something to be investigated more and more and more and incorporate because it just seems, I mean, you know, sometimes you just can't explain things in the way that we're able to validate stuff at this point in time. You know, we, well, that's, it's because we have, we, we, we create rules of what you can say to validate something assumptions that aren't true right right uh, but let me, let me give you an example of, of how this actually works so you can go to a website anybody to confirm this called alivewater.com so they they the creator inventor guy whoever that is you know says based on the work of a guy named Schauberger when you put water in spiral motion it creates improved coherence or structure in the water. And then he says, if you're talking about detox, detox means getting rid of stuff you don't want, right? That's what we're talking about. So he says, if you do that to water, it will get rid of, say, the chlorine from your tap water. And when you hear that, anybody thinking or hearing that should say, no, that's crazy. Because how can you put water through, you know, it goes like this. How does that get rid of chlorine? So anyways, I have a, a greenhouse and I put all my water through this vortexing thing. And what I noticed is that compared to just putting a hose on or putting it through something, there's an intense smell of chlorine in the air after I put it through this vortex. And the theory is, and whether that's right or not, I don't know, but the theory is when you change the bond angles of the water, right, you change the coherence, that doesn't allow the chlorine to stay dissolved in the water. It creates what Pollock calls an exclusion zone. Mm -hmm. and that pushes the chlorine out and then it volatilizes as gas. Now, the question is, is that right? So they have a test that you can see on their website they measure the chlorine in the incoming water, six parts per million. 
they measure the chlorine on the outside and all they did was put it through this you know internal vo and it's one part per million <laughs> so whether you believe it or not you see there's a difference between i don't believe that's right i know from from the evidence that that is correct why it's correct i don't really know i have a theory that that's what it's doing but the problem in science is they say well i don't believe that because it's not what i think is true so even though you show them the evidence oh here's the test here's the final test they you can do it a million times you get the same result and the oxygen goes up you didn't add oxygen but putting it in spirals and surface area makes the ox it picks up oxygen the nitrate goes down and so it it cleanses the water now you could reproduce that in a in a person by if you could make their water more coherent and there's a lot of ways of doing that that would push out stuff you don't want and it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not <laughs> because that's the facts that's the problem we have is you go to your doctor and say well i put you know dmso and now i'm all better no that doesn't work there's no study that shows that therefore you're wrong <laughs> i mean that's that's not yeah. how human beings think except well doctors. the other thing that's really interesting right now and this this was on some of the work that um from biogeometry with that Dr. Ibrahim Karim is doing. He's even looking at a whole science of quality that he's sort of looking to find different ways to assess, essentially how to assess living systems, right? Because we're so used to to really kind of this this materialistic way of sort of looking at the parts, right? And, and I, there can be some information from that that can be valid, I think, to a certain point, but it's not the same as looking at it from a living system. So, and and that's, you know, what, what I'm excited about is to see the different ways that we're going to be able to develop to assess living systems, because it's very different than assessing dead tissue or, or non-living systems. So, you know, even doing a, a simple experiment with using, you know, even in your farm, straight tap water, um, versus tap water that is run through that machine in plants and looking to see maybe how they grow differently, right? Or are you seeing a higher nutrient load or, or are they just getting bigger? Are they more robust? Whatever it might be, but you can see sort of these, these qualitative tangibles that you, can, that you can still measure in a different way, even if you don't know exactly why. Yeah, I mean, I did that with a strawberry bed in Napa where we took a 70-foot bed and we used to go there once or twice a week. So a lot of the strawberries would would rot in between just because we weren't there. So I took half of the bed and watered it with just our, you know, our essentially well water. And the other half I put through this shower head, which makes it basically converts it into mm -hmm. an implosion vortex thing. And, you know, the, the strawberries and everything else was more or less the same, you know, as far as I could make it. And it was very clear, besides the fact that the strawberry plants were about twice as big, is that they didn't rot. Yes, so that's what that's, I've heard too. And that's because, I, I mean, I don't know why, but somehow the, that there was some signal or some coherence of the water structure that made them resistant to molds and just normal decay. And that convinced me that you know, if I didn't want to, I mean, basically, if you're sick, you're decaying. Mm -hmm. It's it's really as simple, and you're decaying because that's the nature of things when they lose their structure, they lose their coherence, they decay. Now, if you don't want to decay, if you want to decay, that's fine. But if you don't, you should do everything you can to increase your coherence which is mostly this crystalline structure of water. And that's really what we call cleansing or detoxification is get out the, you know, all these impurities make it so you can't form a proper living crystal, which then decays and then you're sick. Yeah. Now you are a pretty big proponent around getting back to the laws of nature and that a lot of healing, I think, and I would say the same thing. I mean, most of the time, I mean, gosh, even like, 
back in the day, if you were still not doing well, they literally would, you know, indigenous sometimes would put you out into nature to go and hang out for a few days and just be in the nature period and let nature start to try and heal you. There's definitely a, a healing power imbued in nature. From your perspective, then, what does it actually mean to abide by the laws of nature? And, and I guess, where have we diverged from that path? Because it seems like if we connect back to that, probably part of the cleansing and health is inherent in that process. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically everything, you know, and how, how we diverged, I mean, we've every way possible. Most, most people, you know, <laughs> hardly ever do anything outside that's sort of useful you know, creative work, they don't produce their own food, they're not in the sunlight, they're not grounded to the earth, they're not breathing clean air, drinking clean water, they're drinking manufactured, everything in their life is manufactured by people, every experience. And so that's not a real human experience. And so that doesn't create this human structure, which is the basis of health. So, you know, and it's easy to see with electromagnetic fields where the energy that we download from the so-called ether, which is the electromagnetic field around the, you know, covering the earth, so to speak, is from sunlight and from the earth's field and from lightning and all kinds of things. And most people have substituted that for man-made pulsed electromagnetic fields, which then gives you the wrong signal and then you're sick. So it's the first step with anybody, you know, go back into the real world. And, and anything, you know, almost everything we think is, is contrived manufactured opinions. And we don't even know, we have this sort of almost like an epidemic of, if you ask people, how do you know such and such? They don't know. How do you know there's a virus? I don't know. How do you know there's a ribosome? I don't know. How do you know DNA is in the nucleus? Or it's a double helix. It actually comes from one study of a X-ray crystallography image where they exposed a dehydrated nucleus to X-rays for 62 continuous hours. And it formed a pattern on the x-ray field that looked to Watson and Crick like a double helix. So that's how we got to this. Most doctors, they tell you that, you know, your problem is genetic. Uh, they don't have a clue where the, the whole theory that DNA is the, uh, the chemical of heredity comes from. They don't even know that it's been disproven that different tissues and cells of your body have different DNA. Barbara McClintock showed that without a doubt. And so that blows the whole theory. Uh, they don't, they don't know where it came from. So we all just, we are a, a culture of believers, not knowers. And that's very dangerous because whenever you believe stuff that's not true, eventually you'll do something stupid like you believe there's a virus so eventually you put a mask on and that mm -hmm. degrades your health you know tom one of the pieces that you had talked about in this connecting back to nature and whatnot one of the parts of this was connecting the energies of a higher power that's bigger and wiser than yourself it reminded me of a conversation i had with another guest um, named RJ Spina, who's had one of my favorite interviews that I've had so far. And he was talking about a couple of things that I think tie into what, what you're even getting at in some ways, maybe just different language around it. But he talked about it as he talks about the EMI or the ego mind identity and the, the ego mind and the intellect. And he said that essentially the ego mind identity is incapable of decoding and discerning intention so that humanity is constantly tricked and sort of coerced or manipulated by something that looks very like a good idea maybe from a logical or linear program but is not necessarily coming from a pure intention and he said the only way to really recognize and discern intention 
is through detachment of the ego mind identity and the five senses. And, and from that, then we allow ourselves to connect to higher intuitive faculties that start to come online. And it, it makes me think about the whole process of even being able to question things and to let them go. It, it opens the door to be able to actually access information from a different way than maybe just this linear way that we are used to thinking that that's the way that it works. I mean, I don't really know what to say about that. Uh, but what I, one thing I can say is the problem is this linear way that you're talking about actually turns out it's not very linear. It's not even uh, logically or rationally correct. Like to say that that cell culture proves the existence, that's not logical or linear. Or I don't know what, it's nonsense. Uh, and so I'd be happy right now if we just started thinking logically and rationally. <laughs> Forget about, I mean, I'm all for higher powers and all, that's fine. But, I mean, we don't even have the basics of, you know, if there's no gremlins, I'm not going to believe they're gremlins. Mm -hmm. Like, that's where we're at. We're, we're like, we're, we're make-believe. You know? I, I think where that comes in, though, Tom, is that... Um... From my perspective, before you can even start to use logic and, and rational thinking effectively, there's almost a process of having to actually detach from what you know to be true in order to even be open to even experiencing that. Because this is, this is part of the problem. Like I think you were open enough to actually question things to then see the logical reality of what you're looking at. A lot of people could look at that straight through and still not be able to accept it. So yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a bridge there somewhere where I think to even be able to use logic in, a, in the, I think the true sense, almost like the scientific method, there has to be a letting go of, I guess, how I would interpret the, the, what we think we know to be true and that we're holding on so tightly to. Yeah, but I mean, I, to me, the biggest part of that reason is there's been a subtle manipulation, not so subtle really, but to get people to have so much invested in believing in the narrative. Mm -hmm. In other words, most people are in a situation where if I don't believe what I'm told to believe, I lose my job and my friends and my wife and my kids hate me. And I don't know who I am and I don't have anything. It's like you're, you're in a tribe and they're going to throw you out to be eaten by the lions. And most people, their life depends on believing this. Yeah. Now that, that's actually, I think, the kind of technical definition of being in a cult. Because <laughs> if you don't believe, even though they may hurt you, they may humiliate you they may even tell you to kill yourself but your option are these are all my friends my money my so my, i don't have any family otherwise i don't have nothing and most people aren't going to go there because i don't know why exactly but there's a you know it's obvious in a way they they don't want to take the risk and they don't realize this is to me where the higher power comes in if you, if you take the commitment, I am not going to compromise. I'm only going to go where my, my, inst my instinct and my thinking lead me, no matter where it is. The, to me, the, the angelic world helps you out. And yeah. you will end up in a place that's so much better than you ever imagined. I mean, that's how I've tried to live my life. And I consciously, at, you know, connect with this realm and say, you know, I don't know what to do here. And not to say you don't get it wrong. That's not, that is irrelevant. You just say, I'm going to do my best to wherever this it leads me. That's what I'm going to do. So then you do it. It's, it turns out not right, but it gets to a better place and a better place and a better place. At the end of the day, you've had a wonderful life. The other way, you, people are going to find out that way sucks. <laughs> You're going to, it's going to be just 
one misery after another. And it's never ending because you're digging a hole for yourself, which the, you know, his first rule is if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> uh, and they're digging away and digging. And we haven't seen the half of what's about to happen here. So yeah, I, I am with you on that. And I, I think that that's a really important message though. You know, we did a series a while back called um, just our last series. Part of this one was on know thyself questions to facilitate a return to who you truly are with the idea of bringing the, we're so often giving our authority out to others. And so try and bring back to an inner sense of authority as opposed to an outer sense of authority and, and see what kind of decisions people would actually make from that place as opposed to an outside authority. And it was really fascinating. It was some really, really fascinating questions that came up to help people kind of arrive at that. And, and part of it comes down in the same way to what you were talking about earlier, is that when you do connect to something you consider a higher power, whatever that might be, whether that's source, an angel, nature, however, whatever it means to you to connect to something larger and beyond the, the self with the small s sometimes it's said is then to follow through with the advice that you're given and a lot of times that's that's where the rubber meets the road it may not appeal to you to follow that advice or might be uncomfortable but if you do i feel like that's where a lot of the magic really opens up and again you only know that little piece you know there's this big picture and sometimes hard to know but that's where a certain degree of of faith and trust i think is in line but yeah, if you can I've connect that to that, I've sorry, that go ahead. It's a lot. I talk to my angel. I say, you know, what am I supposed to say or do next? And they say, well, you're supposed to say the heart is not a pump. I say, wait a minute. Like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, but then, but if I was the angel or whatever, if I didn't do it, I wouldn't tell me again. So if you're going to do this, you know, you can try to understand why, but, and, and you do, you say, well, okay, I gotta, I gotta figure this out then. And is this true? Turns out it is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, then you, you gotta do it. Otherwise, if that was me, I wouldn't talk to you either. You know, I, do you, did you ever read any work by Dr. David Hawkins? He wrote a book called Power Versus Force and a number of other things. Really, really quite fascinating, um, person. And he used to say that if, if you denounce the gifts from God or source, then you deny yourself access to those gifts. Yeah, absolutely. So if you choose not to, then you, and it's not that they're going to stop giving it to you. It's that you by your own volition are actually denying them and then yeah. you will not receive them anymore or close yourself to them. So, um, I mean, it's an interesting conversation, but, um, I know that kind of went a little bit of a different tangent from detox and cleanse, but when we do a series like this, we want to break it out into all aspects. So we'll, we'll talk about detox and cleansing from mind, body, spirit, all of it. Cause I think it's, we're, we're one big totality of all of these things. So you, you know, if you just want to talk about the physical, it's, it's a limited piece. Yeah. And, um, you know, like you you've even talk about coffee enemas so much. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and you've bridged into the idea of the role of consciousness and healing. And, and I guess I'm taking from that, that is a direct input because how we think, how we feel, the field that surrounds us ultimately will influence the water within our system, which is sort of the delivery message. And the, the antenna picks up is the consciousness field. Mm -hmm. Delivers that to the water, tell it to make London Bridge. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I mean, you see some of these, these studies like that, and it's, it's hard to go back to thinking a specific way when your mind's kind of been blown and expanded to a point where you're like, like something's going on, right? Yeah. So, Tom, I really appreciate your time and being able to go through all of this stuff with us. Maybe one final thing, just because this is a big deal right at the moment, but specifically around things like EMF. What are your what are your top sort of suggestions for protecting from EMF? And I guess from what we just talked about, do you feel that from a certain point, 
can the field of consciousness even change our reaction to EMF that we're currently exposed to? What are your thoughts on that? We're about to find out. <laughs> and, and we're about to find out which, if any, things actually work. You know, I, I have different pendants and orgone devices and different, you know, things that either block or tr transform. And, you know, there's all a certain amount of evidence that this or that might work. Um, and I use a bunch of them. But I don't really, you know, we don't really know what ultimately is going to, quote, work. I mean, it's really a, it's a, it's a stupid situation to be in, to have to try to figure this out. I mean, they, there's no reason to do this. If they understood electromagnetism and energy generation, you can power the world without any of this stuff. Uh, but the, but either they don't understand it or they don't want to understand it or they don't want us to understand. And so we're going to find out what w things work and what we can do. And I don't really think that I know the answer to that right now. I'm trying out a lot of different things personally and with telling people, but I don't have the answer right now. Yeah, fair enough. And in the meantime, probably a good idea then for just when you're at home, shut your pull the plug on on your internet overnight yeah, you know unplug the router wireless devices like i don't have any any wireless devices or wi-fi or anything so that's step one get into nature i think as much as you're able to i always find you know I, i've talked to people it was funny i was talking to a, a patient a while back and she had been cut off from news and everything for quite a while. And she was spending a lot of time in nature. And then she came back, turned on the news and she said her whole body, she could feel it. And she said, I feel like I'm being manipulated. She goes, I didn't even understand what that was. That was just a feeling in her body, but she, because of the contrast, sometimes when you get away from something long enough and then you expose yourself to it, you feel it more. Um, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. So I don't I, but, even know how, how off we really are we don't even have a clue mm -hmm. but maybe this this experience will help some of us get there because it's a big it's a big awakening this last two years yeah that's for sure that is for sure tom where can people learn more about the work you're doing where can they find some of the different products you've got and where they can get the access to the lectures and the different information you're doing yeah, I think it's all that, like you said, drtomcowan.com and drcowansgarden.com. Wonderful. I will make sure all of those are in the show links there so everybody can check that stuff out. Dr. Tom, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good to see you again. You too. All right.